Comparing democratic socialism to traditional socialism, or God forbid communism, is fear-mongering. It's inaccurate. But it's actually, it's actually pretty reasonable. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. <laughs> democratic socialism. Uh, what's the difference? Huge difference. Except that it's not. Here's Bernie Sanders when asked, describing democratic socialism. And what democratic socialism is about is saying that it is immoral and wrong that the top one-tenth of one percent in this country own almost 90 percent, almost own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. You see, every other major country providing health care to all people as a right except the United States. Those are some of the principles that I believe in. And I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden and Norway and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. Okay, this is pivotal because there's a myth going around that democratic socialism is inherently different from traditional socialism. Bernie Sanders did not articulate a worldview there at all. He just pointed to things that have existed since the beginning of time, told you that you should be angry, that you deserve stuff, and presented you with a Christmas wish list. That's not a worldview, that's how you buy votes. It's time for who do you trust? Hubba hubba hubba, money, 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 who do you trust? Me? I'm giving away free money. Allow me to contrast. If someone asked me, what is conservatism or federalism or constitutionalism, whatever you want to call it, it's pretty simple. My worldview inherently believes that individuals, when left and given the freedom to make their own decisions, tend to do so more effectively than government bureaucrats in Washington. Also, I believe that it is morally imperative to provide people with said freedom and liberties. That's it. That's it. I didn't promise you any free shit. Head. And we'll get into the nitty gritty, but the macro is first because we'll come back to reference this. Of the two worldviews, there is only one that allows and acknowledges human nature and one that necessitates humans be inherently altruistic, particularly those in government with a D next to their name, completely immune to corruption. I have brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. Your new empire? Don't make me kill you. Whereas my worldview allows for the human nature of some people being good, some people being turd nuggets, and allowing them to make their own decisions and the invisible hand of market forces to mitigate the damage as opposed to the damage that can be done in a centralized power. I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. So right away, before we get into the nerdy math, and we will, you have to decide what it is that you believe. Because right away, the democratic socialists will try and poke holes in your argument. What a lot of people may not realize is that America is kind of already a socialist country. Some of the most obvious are things like Medicare and Social Security. Free K through 12 education. National parks, prisons, and the whole justice system. The postal service. Disposal of your toilet waste. Even the army are all socialist programs. Leftists inevitably try and paint you into the corner that Anything provided by government at all equates to socialism. And that comes back to the worldview. You need to understand what is the legitimate role of government, particularly in the United States. Honestly, have you ever asked yourself that fundamental question? Everything stems from it. The good thing is we have pretty clear blueprints. The Constitution is how, the Declaration of Independence is why. Definitely read those. Allow me to give you an analogy that my dad provided with me and I think is appropriate here. The role of the government, as per the documents that we have, is very similar to that of a hockey referee. Specifically hockey, you'll see why in a second. The job of a hockey referee is to ensure the safety of the players and ensure people are obeying the rules in a way that keeps the pace of the game. Keeping the players, i.e. the citizens, safe. That would mean that the military, some form of police force, is of course a legitimate role of government. Having regulations in place to ensure that people don't steal or screw other people, of course that's a legitimate role of government. Anything beyond that purview is considered incidental and the referee in hockey keeps his whistle in his pocket. Also, there's a certain element of self-regulation to hockey not seen in other sports, which one can appreciate. Two drop it as Spencer comes in and he goes down. As Contrast that with the European socialists in soccer. 
very clearly defined role. The referee's job is not to pick winners, losers, high scorers, to provide medical assistance, to be a water boy or a cheerleader, or even to draft the teams. So I don't want to get too far off into the weeds, but I find it funny that democratic socialists use the post office as an example for success. <laughs> the post office was awful until, surprise, FedEx provided competition. Overnight shipping, two-day shipping, it didn't exist. It got there when it got there, you hoped. Also, before FedEx, tracking numbers didn't exist. That was your post office. You want to see government-run health care? Take that and add cancer. Schools are another example. Your parents were raised without a federal department of education. They still had public schools. They were funded by their municipalities and their states. And guess what? Results are pretty similar. Most of your parents are smarter than you. And that's the beauty, again, of the worldview of constitutionalism. There's a very limited role of the federal government in D.C., but states and municipalities have the right to enact government services that the federal government does not. If one state wants to tax you out of existence to provide schools and free weed to everybody, they're free to do so, just as surely a decent state doesn't have to. Again, when accounting for human nature, you want a decentralization of government power. This groundwork has to be laid here because it's pivotal that you understand the difference between your opinion, how you would like systems to work, versus how they are legally designed to operate. So to be fair, let's go to Democratic Socialists of America and their description of democratic socialism. Democratic socialists believe that both the economy and society should be run democratically to meet public needs, not to make profits for a few. Now, right away, they say that because people hear democracy and believe that it's somehow inherently noble and subconsciously delineates between socialism and democratic socialism. There, there is no difference. It's why Vladimir Lenin famously said, democracy is indispensable to socialism. So you may want those things, but right off the bat, the United States is not a democracy. It was never designed to be a democracy, and it will never be a democracy so long as the Constitution stands. The United States has always been a constitutional representative republic. Why and how's it different? Because the Founding Fathers understood that for freedom to be maintained, it was pivotal that the rights of the minority were not entirely beholden to the ever-changing will of the majority. See, pure democracy sounds nice, but in reality, it's mob rule, which is why it inevitably collapses. Again, you're not accounting for human nature. If every one has a vote, they're going to vote in their own self-interest, and the mob will vote to take stuff from the minority. I want, I want, I want, me, 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 mine, 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 now, now, now. <sighs> Good example would be when people first came to the United States in colonies under John Smith. Prager University has a great video on this. Originally, the goal was the betterment of the community, not the individuals. So uh, grain, food, resources were communal and people took what they needed. What inevitably happened is some people were more productive than others and the system began collapsing and people starved. That invariably happens with some model of socialism. It's just a matter of time. And when that time comes, you have a decision to make. Either you go to full-fledged communism where the government has to control all aspects of commerce, or you go the other way, free market enterprise capitalism, which is what John Smith did saying, okay, this isn't working, everyone, you're in charge of yourself, and prompted the famous phrase, he who does not work does not eat, which he was quoting from the Bible. Yada, 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 fast forward hundreds of years, you have an iPhone 6. Again, human nature. If, if you yoke yaks, if you yoke two yaks or a few yaks, I don't know how many, you, can you yoke? They yoke yaks. I don't think they yoke yaks. I think they yoke yaks. They yoked a yak. Oh. If you yoke them together, they are going to move as fast as the slowest yak. Centralized forms of government do this. They pull people back. They're incapable of pulling people forward, which is why Lenin famously said of socialism, the goal of socialism is communism. Ah, Russia. Okay, let's go right back to the Democratic Socialists' own website. Democratic Socialists do not want to create an all-powerful government bureaucracy. Today, corporate executives who answer only to themselves and a few wealthy stockholders make basic economic decisions affecting millions of people. We believe that the workers and consumers who are affected by economic institutions should own and control them. Own and control them. And how are you going to do that, Democratic Socialists? <laughs> Damn it. Important to note right off the bat, uh, most businesses are not helmed by millionaires. Most of them are small businesses. By the way, who's most affected by said economic institution or business? Uh, maybe instead of just the worker, could it possibly be, um, oh, I don't know, the business owner who incurred all of the investment and risk? Yet according to the Democratic Socialist's own website, all of that control should be given over to the worker. Why? 
because they said so. Who's going to do it? The government bureaucracy that they just promised wouldn't happen. Little known fact, it's going to be done at gunpoint. That's what government does. That's what taxes are. You give us this, or men with guns come and take you away. You are one first class idiot. Oh, really? <laughs> you may not like Walmart's wages, but when was the last time they gangster punked you? Moreover, the fall of communism should not blind us to injustices at home. We cannot allow all radicalism to be dismissed as communist. That suppression of dissent and diversity undermines America's ability to live up to its promise of equality of opportunity, not to mention the freedoms of speech and assembly. Okay, here's just the point where I'll ask you to point me to any socialist government that allows for freedom of speech. In the short term, we can't eliminate private corporations, but we can bring them under greater democratic control. The government could use regulations and tax incentives to encourage companies to act in the public interest. Key detail here, in the short term, we can't eliminate private corporations, which would imply, in the long term, the goal is to eliminate private corporations. That sounds familiar. The way to crush the bourgeoisie is to grind them between the millstones of taxation and inflation. <laughs> Thanks, Cutout Lenin, for refreshing my memory. So the goal is to discourage companies from acting in the interest of you, the consumer, in order to appease the social justice worker. Which is funny because it's counteracted by another point on this very page. We don't agree with the capitalist assumption that starvation or greed are the only reasons people work. People enjoy their work if it is meaningful and enhances their lives. So right before this, the democratic socialists tell you how they're going to force your company to produce and operate, and then in the very next paragraph tell you, oh no, but we believe that if people are left to their own nature, they truly enjoy work, specifically the work that we force you to do. People will love the forced work we give them. Although a long-term goal of socialism is to eliminate all but the most enjoyable kinds of labor, we recognize that unappealing jobs will long remain. Is there anything more leftist social justice warrior entitled millennial than wanting to eliminate all the icky jobs? Jobs like septic cleaning, trash man, snow removal, basically any high paying skilled job that millennials refuse to do as they pursue their eight year degree in gender studies. These tasks would be spread among as many people as possible rather than distributed on the basis of class, race, ethnicity, or gender as they are under capitalism. Rather than distributed on the basis of race, class, ethnicity, under cap- what? Nothing is distributed under capitalism. Nobody says, I need this trash picked up. You, black man, do this. Also, I won't pay you. Hey, f*** you, mama. Thank you very much. That's the beauty of free enterprise. Not only does it create a truly free market of ideas, goods, and services, but jobs for people who are willing to perform those jobs if people are willing to pay them for it. No government force required, which brings us to the linchpin. Although no country has fully instituted democratic socialism, the socialist parties and labor movements of other countries have won many victories for their people. We can learn from the comprehensive welfare state maintained by the Swedes, from Canada's national health care system, France's nationwide child care program, and Nicaragua's literacy programs. See, this is what every failed economic economic system does, whether it's communism, socialism, socialism, or democratic socialism is, oh no, 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 it, it would work, just nobody else has done it yet. All the other people didn't do it right, but I will. And then they cherry pick data from individual facets of countries in order to make their point. Like Nicaragua's literacy program. Okay, why don't you talk about their GDP? Canada's nationalized healthcare system? Why don't you talk about the crushing debt in the Supreme Court case that ruled it a violation of human rights in 2005? Sweden, it's now the rape capital of the Western world and on the verge of cultural and economic collapse. Good for you, Sweden, you finally pulled one out. Oh, but that's right, the failsafe is these places weren't real democratic socialism. Not like these people want to do, we just have to trust them. Speaking of trust, let's move to some of the most notorious supporters of democratic socialism, uh, noted neurosurgeons at the Young Turks. And so many people who would really benefit from his policy ideas are against him because they've bought into the Bernie Sanders fear-mongering. Oh, she said fear-mongering, drink. Trigger warning, if you play that game, you're gonna get hammered. They hear the word socialist without really understanding what it means. Why is it that the middle class and the working class pays a higher percentage of their taxable income um, to the federal government, and then you have these massive multinational corporations not paying anything in taxes. Um, because you're comparing corporations versus individual income? Couple of things here. Under Bernie Sanders, noted democratic socialist, the middle class would pay more. A lot more. 
Yeah, if you're making 50000 a year, you'd be paying over $5,000 more a year, so there's that. I know, I know, some of you are saying, but we'll get free health care in college. Again, if you believe that everyone in government is beyond corruption and those things will happen efficiently. Again, let's go back to the analogy, uh, health care. Like the post office, only add cancer. College? This goes back to the worldview. What if I don't want to go to college? What if someone decides, again, human nature, out of their own free will to take that job cleaning septic tanks that millennials refuse to do and he gets paid well? Why should he be taxed more to fund your decision to college? There's the practical and there's the moral. But back to the rocket scientists at the Young Turks. The whole reason for lower corporate tax rates is to avoid punishing the umbrella so that it has more money to give out to individuals, which, ironically enough, are now taxed at a higher rate. So what do you think happens if you tax these corporations these umbrellas more, are they going to take it on the chin? Or fire employees and pay them less? Yes, we have the highest corporate tax rate of any developed country, but when you consider the deductions and the loopholes, we have the lowest. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Wait, which party is it, again, that wants to do away with complicated tax codes and loopholes? Is it... Someone get me a reference? Free market means that the rich people rig the market in their favor. No, it does not. It's actually rigged by people like Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, or would-be Bernie Sanders, big government bureaucrats who get to legally determine how the system operates. Again, democratic socialism necessitates trust that all of these people are beyond corruption and will do what's right for you. Which is why when we're in the middle of economic boom times, which we are right now, corporations are making record profits. Wall Street is at record highs. Right off the bat, this goes back to a worldview. Wall Street at record highs. So, equities are the single greatest wealth creation tool that have been afforded to a populace since ever. If you have a 401k, retirement, you've invested it all, guess what? You want Wall Street to do well. Bailing out Wall Street is bad. We agree. But Wall Street doing well is not inherently bad for the middle class. In 2009, largely inspired by a rant from Rick Santelli against the big Wall Street bailouts, Tea Partiers protested big government and crony capitalism long before Young Turks or Bernie Sanders came around calling them racists. Occupy Wall Street? They're just copycats who smoked more weed. Debauchery, violence, murder, ultimate end of the marijuana addict. Plate Hopeless insanity. They rig that system so that you don't get to the benefit of your labor. So when even though you're working harder, producing more, yes. you don't get to benefit. You don't get to, yeah. uh, you don't get any of that money. Okay, democratic socialists, let's fix that. How about the middle class, the middle tier workers tie their job entirely based to performance, go. You want them to benefit from their labor proportionally to the corporation? Okay, now all of those employees, just like the top earners in a down year, get nothing and have to fund all of those bleak years out of their own pockets. But if the company is successful enough to do well, despite the fact that 80% of businesses fail, the employees get paid handsomely. Oh, that's right. Unions have opposed that for decades. Better teachers should be paid more, bad teachers less. Now. Okay, American auto workers, you'll get paid more when our reliability ratings go up and sales go through the roof. Now, see, the reason employees are paid less and the reason for this contract is because unlike the business owner, creator, innovator, you decided to forego the risk in order to receive financial security. It's a choice you made. You didn't start the business. You didn't risk your livelihood. You collected a check regardless of annual profits from someone who did. What are they gonna do with that disposable income? Are they gonna do what millionaires and billionaires in the United States are doing where they just kind of Stuff hoard it and they put it in either an overseas account or in a, a, a US account and just kind of sit on it? This is so beyond stupid it defies reason. How do you think millionaires and billionaires got to be that way? By keeping a pile of gold like Scrooge McDuck, no. The only way to become financially successful in a true free enterprise system is through investment and willingness to incur risk. They're gonna go out there and spend the money. They're gonna buy cars. They're gonna fortunately, hopefully one day, for people like me, buy a house, right? Yeah. They're gonna actually go into the economy and they're gonna spend that money. They're gonna go out to eat. They're gonna go out to malls and buy gifts during Christmas time, whatever it is. They spend that money and that's what stimulates yeah. the economy. You and when people are buying shit, companies are kind of forced to hire more people yeah. so they can deal with the demand, okay? But if we're dealing with a situation where people don't have disposable income, they're not gonna go out there and spend anything. Yes! 
Yes! That's what I'm talking about! Young Turks with a grasp on basic economics! You're getting it! That's exactly it! Create an environment where there are more jobs and goods and services can be provided at an affordable market price. It's what Adam Smith referred to as the invisible hand, the market that set prices in demand. So you're catching on, as you said, with lower taxation, less government red tape, putting money back in the pockets of the consumer. I'm proud of you. You're being robbed, not by socialists, but by the established economic system that we've got in America right now. If you like this video, subscribe. Also, my producer, Nake Jared, does fine work. He's in need of employment. I recommend him highly.